Let's pump out some homework problems. This is number 14 from chapter seven. There's a dog pulling a couple sleds across the snow. I was actually doing okay with the drawing of this dog and then I messed up the hind legs. So here's the front half of the dog towing these sleds. We're told that the rear sled has a mass of 100 kilograms, 80 kilograms for the first one. We've got two ropes, which are numbered. We're given the, uh, the coefficient of friction between the sleds and the snow. And we're also told what the tension is in rope one. We're supposed to find the tension in rope two. Well, this is chapter seven. This is applications of Newton's laws, including Newton's third law. So perhaps Newton's third law will make an appearance in this, um, in this problem. Previously, I looked at another Atwood problem where we had to identify an acceleration constraint. And it's a little highfalutin to use that term for this problem, but there is an acceleration constraint we assume that these are all moving together. If they're all moving together, they've got the same velocity. That means the same time derivative of velocity, which would be acceleration. If we can figure out what the acceleration of sled A is, for instance, then we will also know what the acceleration of sled B is. And that will tell us what the acceleration of the entire system is. Why might we wanna know the acceleration of sled B? Well, we're interested in T2. And I noticed that the, the tension T2 is applied to sled B. So if we were to write F equals MA for sled B, the unknown quantity T2 would make an appearance in that equation. If it were the only unknown in that equation, we could solve for it. What other quantities would show up in the equation F equals MA applies, applied to sled B? If we're applying F equals MA along the x-axis, we would have the unknown tension T2, which is what we want. What we, want. we would have the uh, tension T1 pulling backwards, there would also be the friction pulling backwards, but we can find the friction provided we know what the normal force is. And we'll see in a moment that the normal force is very easy to determine. The only thing left in that equation, F equals MA, <coughs> pardon me, would be A, the acceleration. That's why we wanna look first at sled A. Use sled A to find the acceleration. Once you know the acceleration, the only unknown in this equation becomes T2, which is the quantity that we're looking for. So the first thing I'll do is draw a bubble around sled A. And let me write some forces. So I guess I should identify, this is mass A we're talking about. We have the normal force on sled A. We have the gravitational force on sled A. And I drew these with the same length because I'm assuming there is no acceleration perpendicular to the ground, and that means there should be no net force perpendicular to the ground. Some of the forces in the y direction have to equal zero. Na minus mag is zero. You could have guessed this one. It wasn't difficult this time. The ground has to push up on sled A with the force equal to the gravitational force. And now we know immediately that the friction force, F sub K sub A, the kinetic friction on A is mu times the normal force, which is mu times the gravitational force. We can use that now in the horizontal direction. I should have drawn those forces as well. T1 is the, the force within this rope pulling sled A to the right. T2 does not make contact, or this, this rope does not contact sled A directly. So it would not make sense to include T2 in this diagram. In this class, generally, the only forces which matter uh, would be gravity. That's, that's the one example of action at a distance, a force that can influence something without actually touching it. Everything else in this class, for the most part, is contact forces. And the only thing I see contacting sled A would be the rope, and of course, the ground. So I will put F sub K backwards, FKA. I intentionally made this vector shorter than this vector because I'm assuming that sled A accelerates to the right. Some of the forces in the x direction, that's mass A times the acceleration. Do I need to label it acceleration sub A, acceleration sub B, acceleration sub dog? Remember, we're assuming that they all accelerate together. We only need a single symbol. So the acceleration constraint here is, is very obvious. Here's my coordinate system. T1 minus FKA has to equal 
mass A times the acceleration. This is what I'm interested in right now. I want to find the acceleration so I can use it in the equation for sled B. So I will solve for the acceleration, take the sum of the forces and divide by MA. T1 minus, well, here's what, where I will plug in this value for the friction, UK MAG, and then I divide by the mass. Okay, for this particular problem, I think I'm gonna plug in numbers because I don't wanna deal with this gnarly expression for A algebraically when I go to use it in B. It would be much better to just, to just have a number. Okay, so the acceleration of this whole system, not just the, uh, the sled, that's kind of cool that we can find uh, the acceleration of the whole system by applying F equals MA only to sled A. That's because of the acceleration constraint. 150 newtons to the right, minus, well, coefficient of 0.10. Makes sense that it's a low number. That's the whole point of a sled, right? Uh, presumably, the friction between this dog's feet and the snow would be considerably greater. It would have to be. Otherwise, the dog would have no traction. You would need to have a much larger friction between your paws and the snow, if you were a dog. Mass. A, we're talking about mass A here, so I wouldn't put the mass of the whole system, just the 100 kilograms for mass A. And I'm not bothering to write the units now. Divide by that 100 kilograms. What kind of a number are we expecting? Well, we shouldn't get 30 meters per second per second. That would be greater than free fall. So 150 minus 0.10 times 100, that's 10 times 9.8, I guess I could have done that in my head, divide by 100, so 0.52 meters per second per second. That's a very modest acceleration. Makes sense because a, a Porsche can accelerate at what, five meters per second per second. You wouldn't expect a dog to be able to accelerate dog sleds at that rate. That would be a very scary dog indeed. Like one of those Boston Dynamics dogs. Those videos give me chills. Now that we know the acceleration of the whole system, that would include the acceleration of sled B, we can apply F equals MA to sled B. Let me kill another tree here. Now, it, towards the beginning of the semester, I was poking fun of Palmdale, which is near where I live, and now, uh, they, they kind of named it improperly because there aren't very many palm trees here. There are, there are a lot of Joshua trees. And I, I could judge from the class's reaction, I don't think a lot of you have seen a Joshua tree, so I'll have to show you some pictures later. Mass B, normal force on mass B, gravity force on sled B. And let's, let's look back at the, uh, the diagram here. I put a bubble around here now. I see one, two, three contact points. Rope two makes contact with everything inside the bubble, so does rope one, and so does the ground. So you have to make sure you account for all your forces. T2 pulls to the right, T1 pulls back to the left. So it's, it's a single tension, and yet it pulls in opposite directions on mass A versus mass B. Hopefully that doesn't confuse you. I just remember this, a rope cannot push on something, it can only pull. Am I missing anything here? Don't forget about the kinetic friction on sled B. Of course there's friction on sled B. If there were no friction on sled B, would you even need the dog? Couldn't you just kick this thing with your foot and then it would just slide forever? I suppose air drag might slow it down, but at low speeds, there's very little air drag. So without friction, your, your uh, sled is just levitating. I know some of you in the class have watched that recent Disney show, The Mandalorian. I noticed that in the show. Uh, a lot of times they've got pack animals, you know, beasts of burden, pulling these levitating uh, cargo platforms behind them. It seems a little silly. If you could levitate the thing, you've just eliminated friction. Why do you need to pull on it? Could you just, just kick it with your foot and it would sail a good mile before air drag slowed it down. Anyway, I'm not here to, uh, to denigrate Star Wars or its affiliated shows. 
do we need to uh, to write f equals ma in the y direction? You can see this is exactly like it was for sled A. The normal force on sled B is equal to its weight, or by weight, I mean the gravitational force on it. And that means that the friction force on sled B, we got to label this F K B, would just be mu times the gravitational force. Now we can go to the X equation. Some of the forces in the X direction is, or is equal to mass B times mass B's acceleration. I don't need to call it A sub B. There's only one acceleration in this system. And here's where we get the quantity that we want. Remember, the problem was asking for tension T2. This tension is going to make an appearance in this equation. T2 minus T1 minus, I'll go straight to substituting mu mg. That has to equal mass B times the acceleration. We're solving for T2. So how about, how's about, I put all this other stuff on the other side of the equation. T2 would be T1 plus, and both of these terms have an M sub B in common, so I can factor that out. And I hope we get a reasonable number here. Let's think about it for a moment. The tension in the rope is T1. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, that that's the tension in rope one. It took 150 newtons to pull this sled against its, the friction on it, against friction. This rope has to accelerate not only sled B, but sled A behind it. So this, this tension would have to be higher than this tension because it's dragging both sleds. You could argue that the, this tension only has to accelerate sled A. That's one way of thinking about it. So I'm expecting T2 to come out as a larger number. Okay. Let's plug those numbers in. 150 newtons plus, well, mass B is 80 kilograms. 0.10 times 9.8, that would be 0.98 plus the acceleration that we already found, 0.52. Point nine eight plus point five two. I hit the equal sign first. That's equivalent to using parentheses. Times eighty. Order of operations. Casio knows how to do that. Plus one hundred and fifty. I find that the tension is two hundred and seventy newtons. It sounds about right. It would have to be greater than T one. And we have our answer. Is there another way to solve this problem? I believe there is. And let's try that other method to check that we get the same answer either way. I could make a different choice with my bubble. Instead of drawing a bubble just around sled B, how's about I do this? If I write F equals MA for everything inside this bubble, T2 will make an appearance within that equation. And there's an added simplification here. It's true that uh, if, I, if I look at all the forces on everything, inside this bubble. I, I do have a tension T1 that's pulling to the right on mass A, but I also have a tension T1 that's pulling to the left on mass B. Those two forces, equal and opposite, they would sum to zero in my equation. So I can just disregard them. Another way to put that is to recognize that those are internal forces. Those are forces exerted by two pieces of the system on each other. They're not coming from the outside. When you apply F equals MA to any system, which you just call M, and is the total mass, you only have to write down the forces that come from outside the system. And the forces I see that come from outside would be this rope at the contact point here. I see gravity pulling on the total mass of the system. And I also see those two friction forces. And then of course, the normal force as well. So let me apply F equals MA to the whole system now. I should have room to do that here. And I'll do a little free body diagram. So sled A plus sled B. I don't have to worry about the ropes because we pretend that they're massless. I've got a T2. This time there is no T1. T1 is an internal force. It's an equal and opposite pair of forces that sum to zero. But I will have two normal forces, normal force on A, normal force on B two friction forces, FKB, 
FKA, and then those two gravity forces. How about I just call it F gravity A and F gravity B. There's my free body diagram. Realistically, I, I should have made this longer so that the net force is to the right, meaning that the system inside this big bubble would be accelerated to the right. All right, T2, well, some of the forces in the X direction needs to, e needs to equal, I'll put M total times acceleration. That's T2 minus, well, we've already calculated these two friction forces. In each case, it's mu times the normal force. So I'm just gonna factor out mu on the left, g on the right, and inside I'll put the sum of the masses. Those are the only forces I see in the x direction. And that's gotta equal m total times the acceleration. We know the acceleration, we're interested in T2. So this is kind of nice because when I put this on the other side, I can factor out MA plus MB. And inside I would have a mu sub K times G plus A. I sure hope that's the same equation that I had previously. I'm kind of nervous now. Uh-oh. Is it? Not quite, not quite the same equation. However, maybe they are in disguise because remember this MA times the acceleration has something to do with that T1. So it's not obvious to me that this is going to give the same answer. Let's check. <clears throat> Mu times G, I already saw that that was 0.98 plus the acceleration of 0.52 and it equals, I'll multiply that by the total mass, 100 kilograms plus 80 kilograms. I'm nervous. Oh, what a relief. Because if that didn't come out right, I would look like a fool to all of you. And you probably wouldn't watch the rest of my videos. So you'd lose respect for me. Assuming that, well, you know what I mean. Okay. I think we can get through at least uh, four or five problems from chapter seven. So I will move on in a moment. Here's the very next problem in your homework, number 15. Pretend this is a vehicle. It's an early model of the Toyota Scion. Maybe this makes it a little clearer that this is the front of the car. What you're told is that two thirds of the weight of this vehicle is over the drive wheels. Remember, the weight's distributed throughout. You may have a bunch of gold bricks or dead bodies in the trunk of your car, in which case the back end would be fairly heavy. But don't forget about the, uh, the engine. That, takes, that tends to make the front end very heavy. And they didn't actually specify whether the rear wheels or the front wheels are the drive wheels. But I'm assuming that the front, wheel, front wheels are the drive wheels. So when they say that two thirds of the weight of the car is over the front wheels, what they're really saying is that the, the ground pushes up on those front wheels with the force equal to two thirds of the car's weight. That means the, the normal force on the back wheels has to pick up that other one third. And of course, N1 plus N2 minus FG would then equal zero. We don't expect this car to be accelerating perpendicular to the ground. Later, we'll look at uh, a curved roadway. If the roadway was scooped out, or if you were going over a hill, then, then you would actually have an acceleration perpendicular to the roadway. But this is a flat roadway, so we're not worried about that. They'd like to know what is the max possible acceleration? This is concrete and the rubber on the tires. So you could look up the coefficient of static friction between rubber and concrete. I think, I'm not even gonna check, I think it's 1.0 in your book. We know it's a rather large number. That's why we have tires made of rubber. We, we want as much static friction as possible between our tires and the road so that we can produce max possible acceleration. Uh, and that's true whether you wanna speed up quickly from a stop. A lot of people like to uh, hit the gas when the, when the light turns green and get going as quick as possible because they're in a hurry to get to that next red light. And we also might want a large acceleration if we have to brake suddenly because we're two inches behind the car in front of us at 50 miles an hour on the highway. Not me, of course, and not you. You would never do that, but a lot of drivers 
do do that. So we need large accelerations. How do we know it's static friction? Well, when you hit the uh, when you hit the accelerator and your wheel starts to turn, you don't want the contact point to be skidding across the, the uh, surface of the road. You wouldn't want to be freewheeling here or peeling out, as they say. The idea is that as soon as your wheel starts to turn, your car moves forward. And that means you're just replacing the point of support. We talked about this at length in class. The whole wheel is moving except for this point right at the bottom. That's the one point on the wheel that's not actually moving. Just for a moment, it's stationary. Okay, so the the max acceleration would correspond to the max possible static friction force. And I hope you remember that we have a, a simple model for calculating max static friction. That would be mu sub s times the normal force. Well, which normal force? If I squeeze this tire harder against the road, is that going to increase the friction between this tire and the road? Of course not. The friction you get between these two surfaces depends on how hard these two surfaces are being pressed together. So it would really be proportional to normal force N2. I don't see any other horizontal forces on this car. I think we just assume that, that uh, you don't have any drive on the rear wheel. So when you step on the gas, there's the drive train, there's uh, some axles in there and uh, maybe a differential and pistons and cams and valves and all this stuff. I really don't know much about. Some of you know a lot more about that than me. But I do understand that when you hit the gas, you, you force the tires to jam into the road and the road pushes back. That's Newton's third law. Once this car is moving, sure, it's going to have some air drag on it. But when you're not moving, that's totally negligible. So when we say the sum of the forces in the X direction is mass times acceleration, um, you know what I could do is just, is just this. I could start by saying, well, the only force in the X direction is the static friction force. That's going to equal the mass of the car times the acceleration. So the acceleration is Fs over M. How simple is this? Well, the max acceleration then would be this quantity is maximum when the static friction force is maximum. Fs max over M. And that would be we've already determined mu times the normal force. Well, the normal force is two thirds of the weight of the car because we're told that two thirds of the car's weight is over the front wheel. So that's going to be mu sub s times two thirds mg over m. See how those masses cancel? That's kind of interesting. It doesn't matter what the mass of the car is. All that matters is that two thirds of the weight is being supported by the front wheel. And here's our answer. The max acceleration you can get would be mu two thirds mu g. Well, mu we, we said was something like 1.0 g. We're very familiar with. Okay, so two thirds of a g, uh, something like 6.6, .6, six to seven meters per second per second. I don't think a Toyota Scion can produce that kind of acceleration, but we know that that Tesla Model S can. We saw the video. Number 25 from the same chapter. This is a very simple Atwood machine problem with a tiny little twist, nothing like the twists we've already looked at. Here's a pulley wheel hanging from the ceiling. You've got a large mass on one side. I'll call that M, a smaller mass on this side. And the picture is actually a little misleading. I'll just call this little m. And big M starts out one meter above the floor. Now, the, the capital M is supposed to signify that this thing is heavier than this thing. We already know what's going to happen then. This will accelerate downwards. Little m, little m will accelerate upwards. And what they tell us is that it takes a time interval of six seconds to reach the floor. So you know what, I'm gonna call down the positive direction and I'll call it the positive Y direction. And I will apply our kinematic 
equation or the kinematic equation for displacement to capital M, specifically the constant acceleration kinematic equation. Now, how do I know that it's constant acceleration? We've already done the work for the formula that gives the acceleration of an Atwood machine. I'm going to skip over the work because we already did it. On an exam, you probably wouldn't want to do that. In fact, if I were to give a problem that required the acceleration of an Atwood machine, I would specify you need to show your work. Now, you may recall it's difference over sum times g. So we need the difference in these masses divided by their sum, and it's the heavier one that goes first, typically, when you write that formula. So big M minus little m over big M plus little m times g. This formula doesn't mention time. That means it's a constant. If it's a constant acceleration, we can use constant acceleration kinematics. So as mass M, big M, suffers a displacement downwards, we can use this formula. V naught T plus one half A T squared, not G T squared, the acceleration. Now, we're told that this system starts from rest. Maybe these masses are being supported somehow, and then they're released and allowed to accelerate. So the initial velocity is zero. And do we know these quantities? Well, we're told that the displacement is one meter downwards. That would be a positive plus one. We're told what the time interval is, and we'd like to know the acceleration. Now, I actually didn't even state what the problem was asking for. They want to know what this little guy weighs, given the fact that M, capital M is 100, 100 kilograms. So we don't actually know how massive this is. We do know how massive this is. We know how long it takes to accelerate down to the floor. Well, maybe you see that if we solve this for the acceleration, we can plug that in here and solve for little m. I mentioned already, you don't have to put something on a scale to weigh it. The other, you could use F equals ma in some sense to weigh something. If you apply a known force to something and observe its acceleration, you can calculate its mass. And that's really what we're doing here in a roundabout sort of way. If I solve for the acceleration, I get two times displacement over delta T squared. I'll just plug these numbers in. Two times one over 0.6 squared. That would be two divided by 0.6 squared. I find that the acceleration is 5.5 repeating meters per second per second. The last step would be to solve this for little m. Mm, fine. I'm going to collect everything with an A on one side and everything with a G on the other. No, that's already done. I'm going to collect everything with a, a big M on one side and everything with a little m on the other side. Here's what I find. Little m times A plus G equals big M plus G minus A. And little m would have to be this coefficient times big M. It kind of makes sense because what if mass m were just in free fall? If this really were falling at 9.8, that would mean that it was way more massive than this, or basically that this mass was zero. And sure enough, if your acceleration is g, the numerator here is zero, which tells you that your little mass weighs nothing. Okay. Let me plug this stuff in. G minus A, that would be 9.8 minus 5.5555. It equals, I'll divide by the quantity, so I'm using parentheses, 9.8 plus 5.5555. It equals, and multiply by the, the known mass of 100 kilograms. 27.64, okay. Is that correct? I'm dying to know. Let me consult your solutions manual, number 25. What? 99? That can't be right. What have I done wrong here? Oh, six seconds, not 0. 0.6 seconds. Of course, it's gonna, of course, six seconds is a, uh, Quite a while, 0.6, that's too quick. There's no way this thing would have fallen. I don't even think in free fall it would get to the surface in 0.6 seconds. I goofed. 
All right, so much for having fun with the, the number 5.55555. If I take two times one and divide by six squared, that's two divided by 36. Ooh, I can still say it. The acceleration is 0 0.055555 meters per second. Let me try this one more time, huh? 9.8 minus, okay, I won't say it. Divided by 9.8 plus. Oops, you're totally missing out on the, uh, the action here. Yeah, I'll round it to 99 kilograms. It's very close in mass to the other one. Now, if these are so close, if they weigh practically the same, wouldn't you expect the Atwood machine to accelerate very slowly? And it does, because it takes a full six seconds just for this mass to descend through one meter. I would expect it to take even longer, but I guess six seconds is a pretty long time. There you go. You can use an Atwood machine to weigh something, which is a lab I've always kind of wanted to do. We just, we've never set that up for all 12 groups, but it wouldn't be difficult to set up an Atwood machine and weigh something by measuring the acceleration. Number 35 from chapter seven. This one's a little tougher, I'm not gonna lie. Conceptually, it's challenging. The math, trivial. Most of the math this semester is really not bad. It's the concepts, as I'm sure you've already discovered for yourself. Two blocks are sitting on top of each other. There is kinetic friction between the surface here and the bottom block and some outside agent, maybe it's a, a person who's attached a rope here, some outside agent is gonna pull, not on, the, not on the bottom block directly, but on the top block. And the idea is that both of these are gonna to start to move and they're gonna stay on top of each other. Together, they will move through a distance of five meters. And we're supposed to figure out how quickly can that happen without the top block sliding over the bottom block. Because you might imagine that if you just, if you pulled hard enough on this top block, wouldn't it just slide right over the bottom block and fall off? So what actually prevents this from slipping with respect to mass B? What keeps them moving together? Well, if they're not sliding over one another, if, there's, if one of them is getting the other one to slide over the surface, but not with respect to itself, did that make any sense? That would have to be static friction. You know what, this is a lot like that table trick, that magician's trick that I've never attempted, where you have tabletop and a whole bunch of expensive glassware. Here's some cups and plates and stuff. You get the idea, hors d'oeuvres. There's gotta be fancy hors d'oeuvres on this. And then the, the magician slash waiter grabs the tablecloth and yanks it so quickly that the tablecloth comes out from underneath the dishes and the dishes are all still there. That's the same idea. If if you pull hard enough, you overcome static friction and your tablecloth has just left the surface before these even have time to accelerate. But if you, if you pull gently, the acceleration of these will be low enough that you're not, you're not asking too much of static friction. Mm -hmm. So let's see, can we boil this all down here? The harder you pull here, the because they didn't, and what's tricky about this problem is they didn't actually tell us what this force is. It's not stated, which is a, a bit of a distraction because you may think that you have to find F to solve the problem. But the harder you pull on this rope, the faster this would tend to accelerate. And of course, that means this would have to also accelerate more quickly if they're going to stay together. But what is the force that gets mass B to accelerate? It's certainly not kinetic friction. If you want mass B to accelerate that way, well, as it's moving that way, the kinetic friction on it is pointing that way. Kinetic friction is not the force that's getting this thing to accelerate to the right. That would have to be the static friction force. So let's definitely start with some free body diagrams. Mass A. This is one of those problems where it may be best to just start writing equations and then the way forward should become apparent after we've written down enough symbols and equal signs. Okay, well, there's the supplied force F. There is, of course, gravity on mass A. And then doesn't mass B 
push up on mass A. It does. And I will call this N B A. This is the normal force of B pushing on A. Hmm. B pushing on A. Doesn't A push back on B? This is something we haven't talked about at great, great length, but when two things interact via contact, when they're touching each other, the forces that they exert are equal and opposite. So if, if this is the normal force of A pushing down on B, I'll give it a vector symbol, then B pushing on A, that force would have to be equal and opposite. So we say those two forces have the same magnitude, but opposite direction. It's important that you include the vector symbols there. Okay, we're going to need that fact. Have I left out any forces? If you try to slide mass A over mass B, doesn't mass B kind of drag backwards on it? That's the force that we call the static friction force. And rather than call it, you know, script F, B, A, I'm just gonna call it static friction. Okay. Where am I headed with this? Let's write some of the forces in the y direction. I'm, I'm looking at mass A right now. Some of the forces in the y direction, well, that's gotta be zero. There's no reason mass A should be accelerating in that direction. So the net force on mass A in that direction must be zero. NBA minus gravity has to equal zero. That seems pretty clear that it's simply the weight. I think we're gonna need this because now that we know the normal force that exists between the two blocks, we can find the max possible static friction force. Okay. Let me go now to mass B. And this is a little tricky. It's easy to miss some of the forces. Is, is this applied force F acting on mass B directly? It is not because the point where the force is applied is on this block, not this block. Remember, you just ask yourself, what's touching your object besides gravity? That's the one force that doesn't need to make contact or doesn't involve contact. So the only forces I see, let's see, we've got the normal force of the surface. Don't forget the, the ground pushing up on mass B. I'm just gonna call that NB. NB is the force of the floor pushing up on block B, but there's also uh, block A pushing down in AB. We just established that the magnitude of this force is the same of the magnitude, same as the magnitude of this force. We already know what that force is. Don't forget about gravity. Okay, floor pushes up on block B. Block A pushes down on block B. To the right, well, the, fr the static friction which exists between these two blocks, it's going to impede the motion of mass A, so it'll push backwards on mass A, but that is the force that gets mass B to move. The only way this block can push on this block is through static friction or I should say push horizontally. So this is FS, but remember, we do have to contend with the kinetic friction, which is, exists between these two surfaces. So don't forget the kinetic friction backwards on block B. Okay, well, in order to calculate the kinetic friction, we need to know the normal force between these two surfaces. The friction between these two surfaces depends on how hard these two surfaces are pressed together. That's what I'm calling NB, not NAB. NB was my label for the, the normal force of the floor pushing up on block B. How do we determine NB? You write F equals MA along that axis. Some of the forces in the Y direction should also be zero for, for block B. So NB minus MG minus a block A pushing down on block B, that's got to equal zero. Okay. Well, let me draw your attention to 
uh, NAB is the same as NBA. That's Newton's third law, which is the same as the weight. So I'm going to factor out the G and I get MA plus MB times G. I suppose that's fairly obvious. Doesn't the floor have to support the weight of both blocks? Of course, it's going to pull up a push up with the force equal to their combined weight. All right. And that means we now know that the kinetic friction force. Now, I didn't bother labeling FKB, but this kinetic friction only acts on block B, not block A, because the floor doesn't actually touch mass A. Mu K times NB, which is this whole expression. So I'll insert that in the next equation. I think we're ready to write F equals MA in the X direction. Let me kill another tree here. Or at least kill a piece of a tree. It's good for the economy. Come on. You just grow, you know, you put a seed in the ground and get another one. <clears throat> hey, maybe you're judging me. You're, you're saying I should be using, um, uh, what is it, OneNote? I should get a tablet. That's green, right? I suppose it's greener than chopping down trees, but guess what? You have to burn fossil fuels to produce the electricity that keeps all those giant servers running. I read an article once about the carbon footprint of the internet, and it's huge. Just the act of uh, checking your email or refreshing a, a web page, you just uh, you just produce some CO two there. I'm not saying that that's evil, but it's tough to to get away from those emissions. <clears throat> Where was I going with this? Uh, I'm still talking about mass B. Some of the forces in the x direction would be mass B times its acceleration. And what are we even doing here? I have a feeling we're trying to determine the acceleration because what they're asking for is, what's the minimum amount of time in which these two blocks can move through this distance? Well, the quicker they do that, the greater the acceleration associated with that motion. So what we're really looking for is the max possible acceleration. Let's write down all the forces and then we'll enforce that requirement. Okay. So all the forces in the X direction, I see static friction minus the kinetic friction, which we've already determined is mu K times the normal force of the floor on block B. That would be the total weight. It's got to equal mass B times the acceleration. Well, max possible acceleration corresponds to the max possible static friction force. So here's where we use this condition. Use FS goes to FS max, which is mu times the normal force. Which normal force? Well, static friction is the force that exists between, it's the friction force that exists between these two blocks. So we need to know the normal force between these two blocks. That's what I was calling NBA or NAB. The harder you push these two surfaces together, the greater the friction you get between them. Okay, so this, is, this would actually be mu s times n a b, and that would be mu sub s times, remember, n b a has to equal the weight of the top block. This part is not so obvious. I think you'd have a tough time reasoning your way through this problem without Newton's laws. If you, if you didn't know how to, to write down these equations, set them up, and solve them, I think you'd have a really tough time just using so-called common sense. Okay, so A max B. I'm going to go ahead and solve this now for the max acceleration and evaluate static friction as the max possible. So I would have mu sub S times the weight of the top block minus mu sub K And don't forget, um, in order to solve for A, after I've substituted here, I would have to divide this whole thing by MB. Before I go plugging all this stuff into the calculator, can I make this a little simpler for myself? Uh, the entire numerator, I can factor out a G. And anything simpler? Let's see. There's two terms with MA. You can barely read my writing here. That's, that's MA. So I will say... MA times mu sub S minus mu sub K minus mu K MB 
all of that divided by MB times G. And now I'm going to pause and plug these numbers into my calculator. You should do the same. See you in a bit. See you in the future. I lied. See you barely in the future because I wanted to remind you the coefficients are given here. Of course, static friction tends to be a greater number than kinetic friction. Okay, get back to work. Reporting back, here's the number that I found for the max possible acceleration. And thank goodness, this is the same number that your book gives or the solutions manual gives. All right, that's not really the answer to the question. They were asking what's the minimum possible time in which they can complete this uh, displacement through five meters. Well, the shortest time corresponds to the greatest possible acceleration. Notice that acceleration is a constant, it's a number, so I can just use displacement as velocity initial times delta t plus one half a delta t squared. Just like the previous problem, the system starts from rest and we're solving for delta t. You know what, this is sloppy, the, the two is supposed to be outside. It's the quantity delta t squared. I'm solving for delta t. Two times the displacement divided by the acceleration and then take what I like to call the two through. Instead of the third root or the fourth root, it's the two through, commonly known as the square root or commonly known. And now I can plug those numbers in two times five meters, divide that by the acceleration of 3.2666, et cetera. Okay. This can be accomplished in 1.75 seconds. If you try to pull these blocks through five meters in any less time than that, that would correspond to a greater acceleration, which would require a static friction force greater than the max possible. That's how you want to think about things conceptually. Even though the most important thing in this class might be learning how to use Newton's laws uh, effectively or appropriately, it's also good to think about cause and effect. And I would say that the faster you try to yank these blocks through the five meters, the greater acceleration that is, greater acceleration would require a larger friction force. There's only so much static friction that you can get between these two. The static friction between these two is limited by the normal force between them. And mass A only weighs something like 40 Newtons. So there's a limit to the amount of static friction. And ultimately it's the static friction which points to the right on mass B, which gets mass B to accelerate. If you try to accelerate these together any, any more quickly than that, then you're, you've maxed out static friction. And of course, block A will just slide over block B. Chapter seven, problem 41, another challenging one. Now all these problems, all the word problems in these chapters are rather contrived. The, the situations are unlikely and they seem a little silly, but this one in particular, there's a book that you've pushed up an incline and you just happen to have a, a cup of coffee connected to that book via a string draped around a pulley. I find myself in this situation on a regular basis, in fact, they give us the mass of the book, it's one kilogram. Something else implausible about this, this problem. When have you ever encountered a two pound physics book? These, these textbooks are always huge, at least 10 pounds. And the coffee cup is 500 grams, that's half a kilogram. We're told that the book is originally pushed or initially pushed so that it's moving, what is that, something like seven miles per hour. The angle here is 20 degrees. And we're supposed to figure out just how far up the incline will this block slide before it comes to rest? And presumably once it comes to rest, it will either stay there under the action of static friction or it will slide back down. So let's do part A first. Let's figure out how far up the incline this physics book slides while dragging the cup of coffee with it. Well, maybe you're getting some sense already at this point that every one of these problems involves a combination of applying Newton's second law, maybe the, the third law as well, and kinematics. Often it's constant acceleration kinematics. If the forces are constant, the acceleration will come out constant, and then you can use your constant acceleration kinematics. Well, uh, how far up the ramp? That sounds like a displacement to me. Maybe we're going to use 
the kinematic equation for displacement. I would just start by drawing free body diagrams and writing equations. Half the time, once you've done that, the way forward is clear. So let's first look at the free body diagram for mass C. Now, you know that rule I usually state where uh, whichever direction you expect something to accelerate, call that the positive direction. I'm gonna modify that slightly. Um, we know that this book is going to slow down on its way up so that the acceleration actually points that way. The acceleration of the cup would point that way. Let's just do the opposite. I think it might be easier to think of up as positive and then correspondingly up the ramp would have to be positive. As long as you're consistent with your choice, it should work out. So for mass C, I've got that single tension pulling up and I've got gravity pulling down. Shouldn't I have made this arrow longer? If, if the cup is moving upwards but slowing down, the acceleration would actually point down. And that means that this vector would need to be longer. Okay, fine. Um, T minus MC G has to equal MC A. I'm just applying some of the forces equals mass of the cup times the acceleration. How come I don't need to write acceleration of the cup and acceleration of the book? Again, it's an acceleration constraint. It's so simple, I'm, I'm just skipping right over it in this instance. The string doesn't stretch, these have to accelerate at the same rate. As I'm calling this positive, which corresponds to this positive, I also don't have to worry about plus and minuses. Okay, well, if this number is greater in magnitude than this, then the left side of this equation is a negative number. And that means that the acceleration is also a negative number. Makes sense, right? If I'm calling up the positive direction, that's why I gave t the plus sign. If up is positive and the acceleration is directed down, then the acceleration should be a negative number. Okay. Can I solve this for t or a? I cannot. This is a single equation with two unknowns. Uh, I need another equation, at least one more equation. Let's go to the free body diagram for the book. Don't forget about the tension pulling down the ramp. And then the ramp is going to apply a normal force to the book. Now the book, we're told that the book is at first sliding up the ramp and slowing down. If it's moving up the ramp, friction, kinetic friction is not going to give it an assist. It's not gonna give it a boost in speed. It would have to point the opposite direction. So FK is down the ramp. And then of course there's gravity, mass of the book times G. And you would, as usual, you would resolve that into a component normal to the surface and parallel to the surface. That angle is also going to be 20 degrees. And it's finally happened. I'm running out of ink. I'm back with the fresh pen. I think we should start with the normal axis. I need to know what the normal force is so that I can express the friction force in terms of the normal force. Um, and for this, I suppose I would need a coordinate system. Let's go with this. Positive y axis, positive x axis. All right, some of the forces in the y direction, that's the normal direction, have to equal zero. I've got the normal force. I've got the component of gravity which is adjacent to theta, so I would subtract mg cos theta, and that's it. I don't see any other forces along the normal axis. So here's another instance in which the normal force is not just mg, it's mg cos theta. The only way to be sure, what's, what's the surefire way to determine the normal force? Write f equals ma along the normal axis, because that force lies along that axis, and it will show up in your equation. Okay, so now I can say that kinetic friction is mu times n. That's mu mg cos. Okay, now we move to the, uh, what I'm temporarily calling the x-axis. Some of the forces in the x-direction is the mass of the book times the acceleration in the x-direction. I'm not even going to bother writing sub x because this acceleration is the same as the acceleration I was referring to when talking about the cup. They have the same acceleration. Okay. I, don't, I don't actually see any forces on the book 
in the positive x direction. They're all directed backwards. So we've got negative t. Oops. Negative t, that's even worse. Minus fk, we know fk is mu mg cos theta, that's mu times the normal force. And then lastly, minus the component of gravity down the ramp, that would be minus mg sine theta. That's got to equal mass b times a. All right, and you'll notice I've got two equations, this equation and this equation, which contain the same two unknowns, tension and acceleration, tension and acceleration. We are interested in the acceleration. Don't forget what the problem is asking for. They want to know how far up the ramp does this book go? Well, if it's accelerating at a constant rate, we can use this equation. Well, you know what? That's not going to get us our answer. Um, we may know the acceleration in a moment. We're going to solve for it, but we don't know t. So ask yourself, what's the other equation for constant acceleration kinematics? What's the equation that relates displacement to acceleration and velocity? It's this last one, b squared minus v initial squared is 2a delta x. We're going to find the acceleration in just a moment. We're trying to find delta x, and we actually do know these quantities. When this book slides, slows down, and comes to a rest for a moment, its final velocity is zero, and we're given the initial velocity. We're told that that's three. So this is the equation we'll come back to as soon as we determine the acceleration using the dynamics of the system. So we've already done, we've already done most of the work. I'll call this equation one. Here's equation two. Look how easy this one is to solve. Since we're interested in A, if I take equation one and add equation two, look what happens on the left side. So we've got a negative T and a T. Those will cancel. I'm just going to do this off in this space. So if I take equation one and add equation two, let's take a look here. Uh, look at the, the two left sides. Both of these terms, this one and this one, have a g in them. So I will factor out a negative g. Here's what I get. Negative mu k mass b cos theta plus mass c. All of that times g equals. And then on the right side, let's see here, one term here on the right side and one term here. That's m sub b, mass of the book. So I factor out a. And I've got mass c plus mass b. I'm sorry, this is mass of the cut plus mass of the book. This is what I'm interested in. Over here. Here's my acceleration. And notice it's coming out as a negative number, which we expect, because I called up the ramp positive, but we know that the acceleration is actually directed down the ramp. Negative mu k mass b cos theta plus mass c over the sum of the two masses. Take that coefficient times g. I'm going to pause, plug all these numbers in. Hopefully you're doing the same. And uh, let's check our answers. Before I forgot to tell you, the coefficients are given. As usual, uk is less than us. US. So use these coefficients and the given angle in this expression. Of course, you're going to need the masses too. Maybe you should pause on this screen right, right there. And I'm so sorry, but I did make an error in my algebra. Maybe you caught it. When I added the two equations, I neglected this, this third term here. I forgot to include the parallel component of gravity in the left side of the equation. So if, if you follow back through to this formula, I should have had one extra term here, plus mass b sine of theta. That's, that's another term that should be added into this numerator. So I'm going to try this again. This number is not what the publisher gave, and I believe it's because I forgot that. Take two. Thankfully, this time, my number came out the same as the number given by the publisher. See, this is why we do partial credit. If you had shown your work like this and then 
forgotten to carry over a term, I can at least give you credit for, uh, for recognizing that this was part of the forces originally. Okay, now that we know the acceleration, we can finish part A of this problem. Part B is gonna be simpler. Most of the work is already done. On the way up the ramp, we'll say that the displacement along the, oh, we already determined it. it's this equation that we need. There's a relationship between the initial and final velocities, the rate at which your velocity is changing, and how far you go. When this thing comes to rest at the top of its trajectory before possibly sliding back down, the final velocity is zero. You know the initial velocity, it's up the ramp. That's a positive three meters per second per second. We already found A, so the distance it travels up the ramp will be negative V naught squared over 2A. It's gonna be negative three meters per second squared over two times. Well, the acceleration is also negative. And we see how those minus signs will cancel. Just how far up the ramp does this thing go? Nine divided by two divided by 6.73. I find that it, it travels something like around 67 centimeters. Yep. Same answer in your book. You can't read that, can you? That says 0.67 meters. Part B. This is the easy part. Excuse me, they'd like to know. Whoa. Well, I'm obviously not going to win a golden globe for editing here. I'm not going to win a golden anything. Uh, does the block stay put when it gets to the top, or is it going to turn around and slide back down? There's the picture. Will it stay put or slide back down? Well, if it stays put, that's because what type of friction is keeping it in check? If there's no mutual sliding of these two surfaces, that would have to be static friction. So let's ask what the max possible static friction force is, and then see if that's uh, more than is necessary. You know, suppose we find that, that this book requires 10 newtons of static friction in order not to slide, but that the max possible static friction is only seven newtons, that means it's going to slide. So step one, this is part B of the problem. Find Fs max. Well, max possible static friction would be mu sub s times the normal force. I think we can look at our free body diagram, which has already been drawn and determine the normal force. Yeah, we already did that work, see that? This result does not depend on whether the block or the book is moving or not. Sure, once the, once the block stops, excuse me, the book stops, this kinetic friction turns off, but that doesn't affect the normal axis. Nothing in the normal direction has changed. So the normal force will still be mu ng cos theta. In this case, it's a different mu. Mass of the book, g cos theta. Let me plug those numbers in. We've got a coefficient. Well, now we're using a different coefficient. Kinetic friction was 0.2, static is 0.5. So 0.5 times a mass of one times 9.8 times the cosine of 20 degrees. And I find that the max possible friction force is 4.6 Newtons. Now we need to figure out how much friction is actually necessary to keep this book from sliding. Well, if it's not sliding, then it's certainly not moving. And not moving is one example of zero acceleration. Yeah, I mean, you could also be moving at constant velocity, but if you're not moving at all, you definitely have zero acceleration. And that means zero force. So in order for the book to be at rest, let's go ahead and just look at the forces in this direction along the axis that I previously called the x-axis. And now, instead of a kinetic friction force which points down the ramp, wouldn't there have to be a static friction force which points up the ramp? Correct. Those are the only forces I see in the x-direction. The tension pulling down, static friction pulling up or pushing up, and then we still have this component of gravity pointing down. So I would say 
static friction minus T minus mg sine theta. That's got to equal zero. And then we uh, get a little hitch here because the tension now is not the same as it was before. It's tempting to, to go back and just use the same number that we have for the tension previously. In fact, I don't think we even solve for that. But it's very easy to get the tension in this case because if you look at the picture again, remember, the tension's the same everywhere. If this thing is not moving, then the upward tension has to balance the force of gravity. So in this case, the tension is trivial. It's just the weight of the coffee cup. Fine. So the necessary static friction force would be, mm, let's see, I can factor out mass of the cup plus mass of the book, sine theta, all of that times g. How much static friction is required to keep this book in check? Half of a kilogram plus one kilogram times the sine of 20. Take that quantity, multiply by 9.8. It would require over eight newtons to keep this book from sliding down the ramp. Unfortunately, the max possible friction we can get between the book and the ramp is 4.6. So your book's gonna slide and your coffee cup is gonna crash to the carpet and probably spill your coffee. It's one of those problems with the sad ending, you know? Not every one of these problems is going to have a Disney ending, kids, I'm sorry. Here's a fun little problem with a surprising result, number 45, towards the end of the homework. All right, this painter has really long arms here, but this is a painter sitting in a, a chair. The chair's got its own mass. The painter is 70 kilograms, the chair is 10 kilograms, and he's hoisting himself up. You know those, uh, those painters that work on the sides of skyscrapers and they're on those uh, trellises? I don't know what you'd call it, uh, scaffolding? No, it's a, it's a movable, I don't know, I would never do that. Issues with heights, you know? But this person can actually pull themselves up. If you've never done this, I'm sure some of you have done rock climbing and rappelling and you've been able to sit in a harness where you can actually pull yourself up by grabbing a bungee cord that's, or a rope that's wrapped over a pulley like this. And the surprising result is 70 kilograms plus 10 kilograms. That's 80 kilograms, which would weigh about 800 newtons. You can lift yourself and the chair by pulling on the rope with a force that's less than what you weigh. So if you weigh, let's say you weigh 160 pounds. With the, an arrangement like this, you could hoist yourself up by pulling on a rope with a force, let's say, of only 100 pounds, which is a little surprising. And it's very similar to those pulley problems that we already looked at. So the question is, what's the tension that you have to produce in this rope? This is a single rope. It's, uh, your hands are attached here, it goes around, and then it's somehow attached to the chair that you're sitting on. So whatever tension you produce, that tension is applied to the chair that you're sitting on. But it's also applied to what? To your hands. There are two contact points between the rope and this system where the system is your mass and the chair's mass. So the, the rope is pulling up on you at the location of your hands and it's also pulling up at the chair. I'm just gonna do this though. I'm gonna draw a bubble like this and consider that the system M, this is the total mass M in F equals MA to be you or the person, the chair, and this little piece of rope within the bubble. And now it's easy to see that there are two points of contact. One here, one here, and of course there's gravity. So I've got a tension lifting up. The tension's the same over here because there's no mention of any friction hitches or knots. So we just assume that the tension is the same throughout. And then of course the gravitational force. We're supposed to figure out how hard this person has to pull on the rope to get the whole thing, to get themselves and the chair to accelerate upwards at 0.2 meters per second per second. So the sum of the forces in the y direction has to equal total mass times acceleration. I've got two tensions minus the total gravitational force. And that's got to equal total mass times acceleration. That's an A. That was easy. Let's solve for tension. I get it's one half of, notice on the right side, I can factor out the total mass. 
and I'd have this. Keep doing that. That's an A. Very cool. And I won't even bother plugging in numbers. Of course, if you plug in kilograms and meters per second squared, you will get an answer in newtons. I think it's more interesting just to note the relationship here. What if you didn't want to accelerate? What if you just wanted to hoist yourself up at constant speed? So if you're rising at constant speed along the side of this building, your acceleration would be zero. And the tension you have to produce in the rope would just be half the total weight. Total mass times G, that's total weight. So if, if you and the chair together weigh 160 pounds, you would only have to pull on this rope with a force of 80 pounds. A little surprising. And again, conceptually, how do we think about that? It's weird, like you, you're pulling on the rope with just your hands, but the rope is pulling on you at two places, your hands and also the chair. I, I still find that a little strange to think about, but I know it works because I've done it. Um, there was a physics professor at Cal State Fullerton who set something up like this and suspended it from the, one of the beams in the ceiling of the physics classroom. And we took turns sitting in it and pulling ourselves up. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Now, of course, if you want to, since we cut the force in half, the required force in half, if you want to lift yourself by one foot through the air, you're going to have to pull two feet of rope through your hands. So, as always, there's a trade-off. You're exchanging force for distance. There's one other problem I'd like to do from this chapter, but I'm sick of hearing myself talk. You're sick of hearing me talk, so I'll save that for another time. The last problem I'll take a look at would be number 44, the helicopter problem. And after that, we're ready to move on to chapter eight. Chapter eight is, is really when you feel like you're learning some physics. We've hit our stride by the time we get to chapter eight and we look at the dynamics of circular motion. Arguably, these first seven chapters are preparation for chapter eight and all the interesting things that we can look at in chapter eight. Really, chapters one through eight, one big unit. It's one big unit, introduction of Newton's laws, and applications thereof. Once we get to chapter nine, uh, we're going to take F equals MA. We're going to take this equation, which is honestly a differential equation because the acceleration is the second derivative with respect to time. We're going to take this differential equation and integrate it with respect to position and introduce the notion of work and kinetic energy. And that'll last us a couple chapters integrate with respect to position and we get energy. The chapter after that, I believe that's chapter 11, we're going to integrate this same equation with respect to time and we'll introduce the notion of momentum. So you've really seen, I think you've seen all the fundamental physics you're gonna look at this semester. You've already seen it. Uh, at Newton's second law, which is all, uh, well, it's rather intuitive. Everybody sort of knows the truth of F equals MA. We know that when you push on something harder, it accelerates at a greater rate. We know that the more massive something is, the slower its acceleration. So this is just a, a mathematical statement of something we already understand. And once you throw some calculus at it, I was just mentioning integrate this with respect to position or with respect to time, you, you can um, put it in an alternate form that's more useful for certain types of problems. But F equals MA, Newton's third law, which is the equal and opposite, uh, force pairs for uh, contact forces, and Newton's law of gravity, which we've looked at. That's pretty much it. That's all the, the physics that we're dealing with. The rest of it is just mathematical manipulation of those physical ideas.